Okay, here we go, exam review number one. Evaluate a piecewise function. Now, the thing to remember about a piecewise function is that it is still a function, meaning uh, for every input there can only be one output. So some students have a tendency to want to plug in negative 2 to every single piece of this function, but what that will produce is different outputs for one single input, which will make it uh, not a function. So we have to figure out the right piece of this function to plug this input into, an input of negative 2. So we have to look at the domain restrictions here. If x is less than 0, which negative 2 is less than 0, then we have to use this piece of the function right here. So we're going to plug a negative 2 in for this x, 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. And then same for the rest of these inputs. f, find the function of, or find the value of the function f when x is equal to 0. That fits into this domain restriction right here, 0 is less than or equal to x, less than or equal to 2. So if we plug in a 0 for x, x plus 1 is 1. f of 2 still fits into this domain restriction right here. So 2 plus 1 is equal to 3. Now f of 5, if x is greater than 2, which 5 is greater than 2, we have to use this piece of the function. 5 minus 2 is 3. 3 squared is 9. Okay, new function now, 2x minus 6, this is just a linear function, it's not a piecewise function. We have to evaluate it when x is equal to x minus 10. So this is our input, the input goes in place of x in the equation of the original function. So 2x minus 6 becomes 2 parentheses minus 6 and x minus 10, or excuse me, x plus 10 fills in the parentheses, 2 times x plus 10 is 2x plus 20 minus 6 becomes 2x plus 14. Okay, number 3, we have to evaluate the function f of x, subtract the value of the function when, it, when uh, x is equal to 7. So first of all, I'm going to rewrite f of x. f of x is x squared minus 2x plus 5. Now we have to subtract f of 7. Now if we plug 7 in as an input, that's going to turn the function into a numerical value. So now we just need to find out what that is and subtract it here. So f of 7 turns into 7 squared minus 2 times 7 plus 5. 7 squared is 49 minus 14 plus 5. 49 minus 14 is 35. 35 plus 5 is 40. So we're subtracting 40 now. This part right here represents f of x. This part right here represents f of 7. Combining these two like terms, 5 minus 40 gives us x squared minus 2x minus 35. Okay, number four, evaluate this. If you don't remember, this is called the difference quotient. So, um, just going to put the h in the denominator. It's pretty easy to do. Now, subtracting an entire function, subtracting f of x, to subtract a function, we have to subtract that in parentheses like this. Now, f of x plus h means x plus h is going to replace this x right here. So 6x plus h minus 20. Okay, and then this becomes 6x plus 6h. 6h, we distribute the 6 minus 20 minus 6x plus 20 all over h. Now we uh, combine some like terms here. We have 6h over h, which is equal to 6. Okay. Now finding the domain. This function g is a rational function, rational 
this in the form of a fraction. Now with fractions, remember we cannot divide by zero, so we need to figure out what values of t make the denominator equal to zero, and those are the values that are excluded in the domain. So t squared plus 7t plus 10 cannot equal zero, otherwise the, this would be undefined because we'd be dividing by zero. Now we can solve this exactly like we would solve a quadratic equation, even though this isn't an equation, it, we're seeing what it can do. It's the same principle. This can be factored into t plus 2 and t plus 5. That cannot equal 0. So this is saying that t cannot equal negative 2, t cannot equal negative 5. Here's our domain. It's all values of t such that t does not equal negative 2, t does not equal negative 5. Now for number 6, this function f is a radical function, a square root function specifically, and with square roots, we cannot take the square root of negative values. Okay? The expression underneath the square root needs to be greater than or equal to 0 in order to be able to square root it. So x minus 4 needs to be greater than or equal to 0. If we add 4 to both sides, we get x is greater than or equal to 4. So the domain and interval notation is from 4 to infinity. Okay, piecewise function. The way this was taught in class was to take each piece separately and to make an input-output table of values for that piece of the function. So this piece of the function is only defined if x is less than negative 1. x can't equal negative 1 for this piece of the function, but we, we need to find the value of that function at negative 1 and we're going to put an open circle there because x is strictly less than negative 1. So if x is negative 1, two, negative 2 times negative 1 is 2, 2 take away 2 is 0. So negative 1 comma 0, I'm going to put an open circle there. And now we we'll choose values in this domain. x is less than negative 1, so that means we could choose negative 2, negative 2 times negative 2 is 4, 4 minus 2 is 2. And since this is a linear function, this piece is a linear, all we need are two points. There's that piece, so they can do a little bit better job of that. Okay, now, <clears throat> this piece of the function here, if we made an input-output table, there, is, there isn't a place to put an input. f of x is equal to 3 is a constant function, is what it's called. It has a slope of 0, which is a horizontal line. And it's defined between negative 1 and 2. So I'm going to use these two values, because this, this function is bounded between two x values, between negative 1 and positive 2. Now at negative 1 this function is going to equal 3 and at 2 this function is going to equal 3 but at, at x equals 2 here it has to be an open circle because x is strictly less than not less than or equal to 2. So at negative 1 comma 3 I'm going to put a closed circle but at 2 comma 3 I need an open circle and it's a constant function having a slope of 0. Now x plus 2, if we made an input-output table for here, if x is equal to 2, 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. So 2 comma 4 is going to have a closed circle because x is greater than or equal to 2. And now x can be anything greater than this, so I'm going to use value 3. 3 plus 2 is 
five, three comma five. And there's our piece flies. And just always check, make sure that you still have graph to function. Hey, if you drew a vertical line here, is it still going to pass the vertical line test? It would because this is an open circle, meaning the function doesn't exist here. So this is okay. Same thing here. If I had put the filled in circle here and here, then it wouldn't pass a vertical line test. wouldn't be a function, but this is still okay. Okay. Find the value of the function f when x is equal to negative 1. Here's where x is equal to negative 1. The function value right there is equal to 1. The domain, okay, and range, another name for domain is input or x values that produce outputs. So looking along the x axis, which x values are producing outputs? And we can tell outputs represent points on the graph. For example, we know negative 1 is in the domain because it's producing this output. Or positive 1 is in the domain because it's producing outputs up here. Now this, this graph is increasing vertically, but it's also still increasing in the horizontal direction. It's never going to go completely vertical, otherwise it wouldn't be a function. So no matter how far to the right on the x-axis I go, I can still choose a number here and eventually come up high enough and find a point on the graph. I cannot do that as far to the left, okay? Starting here at negative 2. Now this open circle represents that negative 2 is not in the domain, but everything greater than negative 2 is. So the domain is going to be parenthesis negative 2 to infinity, not a bracket on negative 2 because negative 2 is not included. The range, looking along the y-axis, if I drew a vertical, or excuse me, a horizontal line coming out from the y-axis, if I can hit the graph with that horizontal line, that means that number is in the range. So any of these negative numbers aren't going to be in the range, so I can't hit the graph anywhere here. So I've come up here to zero, and if I drew a horizontal line right here, that that horizontal line goes right through zero. So zero is in the range. Any number greater than zero also, if I come up here on the y-axis and then drew a horizontal line, I can hit the graph here or here as high up as to infinity. So the range is going to be bracket this time, zero to infinity. Now stating intervals in which the function is increasing or decreasing, remember these intervals represent intervals of x values only. Okay, So if I take a look at this piece of the graph right here. Um, look, considering the y values as the graph is traveling from left to right, the y values are increasing. So this piece of the graph is considered to be increasing, but we don't state the points which, that it's increasing to. We state the x values for which the graph is increasing. So between negative 2 and negative 1, between these two x values, this graph is increasing. So we would state that increasing between negative 2 and negative 1 and then here's another increasing interval so union 0 to infinity now if we take a look at this portion of the graph right here. This is where the graph is decreasing, but the x values for which it's decreasing are right here between negative 1 and 0. Okay, Between these two x values. So it's decreasing. Between negative 1 and 0. Now the average rate of change of any function is the slope between the two points defined by these two x values on the function. So it's f of x2 minus f of x1. This represents the change in the vertical, okay, divided by x2 minus x1. This is the change in the horizontal. It's rise over run. The difference of y divided by the difference of x. This is 
same as the slope formula. So considering this to be x2 and this to be x1, 3 minus negative 1 is a 4. Now f of x2 is going to be f of 3. Now f of 3 is going to be 3 cubed, which is 27, plus 3, so that's a 30. And then f of negative 1 is going to be negative 1 cubed, which is negative 1, plus negative 1, which is negative 2. So we have to subtract negative 2. This becomes 32 divided by 4, which is 8. Okay. Uh, number 10. This is asking us to redraw this graph after it has undergone these transformations here. So this right here represents the graph of f of x. We need to draw the graph after it's been transformed. So the x plus 4, remember inside the function, anything inside the function is a horizontal change. And if it's adding or subtracting, that's a static shift, meaning it moves the graph. Yeah, but inside the function is opposite. Remember, plus 4 is going to move the graph 4 units to the left. Minus 2 outside the function. Any transformation outside the function is a vertical change. And if it's adding or subtracting, it's a static shift, meaning it moves the graph. Minus 2 means down 2 units. So if we take a look at some of the, uh, the key points on this graph, like here and here. If we take a look at these coordinates, this coordinate here is... 2 comma negative 1. This coordinate here is negative 2 negative 1. If we move these points according to these transformations, um, if we move this point for example 4 units to the left and 2 units down, let me draw a graph over here. Negative 2, if we move that 4 units to the left, is going to become negative 6. If it starts at negative 2 and goes 4 units to the left, it goes to negative 6. And then negative 1 as a vertical, if that moves down 2, that's going to become negative 3. So negative 6 comma negative 3. And then this point right here, if it starts at positive 2. Why it this point, 2 comma negative 1, if it moves 4 units to the left, it's going to move from 2 over to negative 2. And then the negative 1, if it moves 2 units down, is going to become negative 3. Okay. So here's this bottom piece of the graph right here between those two points that I've transformed. And those are really pretty much the only points we can tell exactly where they are. So draw this. Okay. So these two graphs have the same exact shape. This, these transformations were static transformations, meaning all it did is move the graph on the coordinate plane. It didn't change the shape. It didn't stretch or compress. So this blue graph has been moved four units to the left and down two units. Okay. This transformation here one-third is multiplying f of x. Any transformation multiplying um, the function is a transformation that's a stretch or compression, meaning it changes the shape. It doesn't move the graph, it changes the, the shape of the graph, making it steeper or more compressed or stretched out. Uh, this is outside of the function, this transformation here. Any transformation outside of the function is a vertical change. Okay. So this is going to affect the y components of the graph, because the y components represent vertical. So what I recommend is picking out some of these key points that are easy to identify on the graph. So f of x, the original function, is going to have these points. Okay, negative 3, 0. 
uh, negative 2 comma 4, negative 1 comma 0, 0 comma 4, and 1 comma 0. Now this transformation, one-third times f of x, what this does is all y values multiplied by one-third. So I'm going to take all of these original y values on f of x and make a new table of values of x and one-third of the original y values here. The x values are going to remain the same. You know, 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. But these y values now need to be multiplied by a value of 1 third. 0 stays 0, but 4 times 1 third is 4 thirds. This negative 1 comma 0 stays negative 1 comma 0. But 0 comma 4 changes it to 0 comma 4 thirds. And then 1 comma 0 stays the same. I'm going to draw this on the same graph so you can see how they compare negative 3 comma 0, negative 2 comma 4 thirds, 4 thirds is 1 and a third, so here's 1, so 1 and a third would be about right here, and then negative 1 comma 0, 0 comma 4 thirds, and 1 comma 0, so you can see the graph is in the same location, it's just been compressed vertically, because 1 third times f of x is 1 third of all the y values. Now this transformation here is inside of the function. Anything inside of the function represents a horizontal change. And since this one half is multiplying, it's not a static transformation, meaning it doesn't move the location of the graph. It's going to change the shape. And inside the function, though, is opposite. What's the opposite of taking all the x values and multiplying them by 1 half? The opposite of that is multiplying by 2. So this transformation here is multiply. x values by 2. So if we identify some of the key points on the graph, we have negative 4 comma 1, we have negative 2, negative 1, we have 0, one, one, two, four, negative one. Now, making a new table of values, multiplying all the x values by two, I'm going to change all of these x values to negative eight. Negative 4, 0, 2, and 8. The y value stays the same. So negative 8, this is going to be negative 6 out here. Negative 8 is out here. Negative 8, comma 1. And then negative 4, my negative 1. And then 0 comma 1, 2 comma 2, and then 8 comma negative 1, it's about right here. So the blue graph I've drawn on the same graph to show that this is a horizontal stretch. Okay. Write the equation of the resulting function here for number 14. If we start with y is equal to absolute value of x, then we take that graph and move it down 10 units and to the right 12 units. What we need to figure out is where do we put these numbers as operations inside of the function such that the function would move down 10 units and to the right 12 units. Well, I'm going to start with this one. This is a horizontal change, meaning this needs to be inside the function. The function is the absolute value bars. But if it's inside the function, it needs to be opposite. If it's moving to the right, 
and we're going to subtract twelve. So minus twelve is going to move the graph. Right, and then we're going to shift it down ten units. That's a vertical change, so that needs to be outside of the function. So minus ten. Okay, number fifteen, the graph of y is equal to x squared is reflected across the x-axis and then shifted to the right. So I'm going to start again with this transformation. Moving to the right is a horizontal change, so it needs to be inside the function. Now the thing you got to uh, keep in mind here is, is what is the function? The function is something that's being squared. So if we're going to put this transformation inside of the function, then it needs to be part of what is being squared. In order to do that, we have to use parentheses. So y equals parentheses x minus 7 squared. And it's minus 7, again, because inside the function is opposite. So that takes care of this transformation. Now shifting or reflecting about the x-axis. If you, if you reflect it across the x-axis, that's going to flip it upside down over the x-axis. That's a, that's a vertical change. And that reflection needs to occur outside of the function. Okay, this is part one. Part two is going to include pages four, five, and six.